Hello, I'm Russell Brand. This episode of Under the Skin from Luminary Media is free and it's fantastic. It's got Ricky Gervais in it. Ricky Gervais, one of the best comedy stars the world's ever known. I think it's safe to say he was up there with your Chaplins, your Cleeses, your Coogans. They're all British comedians whose names start with C. That's all I'm interested in. Your Cooks, your Hancocks. Ricky Gervais, outspoken host of the Globes, creator of Extras, The Office, Afterlife, season two of which is on Netflix now and is the it's because of him promoting that that he's even come on our podcast this is for you for nothing but if you want to sign up and get all of the episodes of under the skin which let me tell you are worth it as well as all the other fantastic content that's on that platform podcast from karomo from queer eye no content from uh, lena dunham go on get down then no one's making you stay here. You're not a hostage. I'd say this is a fantastic episode of Under the Skin. I'm very proud of it. It's a brilliant conversation with Ricky Gervais. It's a joy to talk to him. He, and me and him, as we discuss, see the world somewhat differently, although we've got loads of things in common. We talk about God, atheism, animals, love, class, fantastic stuff. You'll really, really enjoy it. If you want to get Luminary, if this uh, episode... Uh, indicates to you that these are the kind of conversations you might be into, then you can get it for as little as $2.99 a month with the with the Luminary annual plan, and you can get a seven-day free trial, which I would recommend to all of you. Check out the brilliant podcasts I've done with, well, other podcasters like on the platform like Lena Dunham and Karamo, but also David Eagleman, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox, Yanis Varoufakis. I mean, there's like brilliant intellectual conversation Naomi Klein I mean it's just like uh, Dr. Shafali last week I mean it's, I really think they're valuable conversations but this one for nothing with Ricky is uh, it's especially good as you would imagine from Ricky Gervais and uh, let me reiterate Afterlife which I've watched is on Netflix now and it's fantastic check it out hello hello mate it's so lovely to see you look at you all grown up I've become an adult. Well, I'm, I'm relieved you're not sat there in a sheet. <laughs> that, that was a deal breaker. I said I wanted to conform to Western ways just for one hour. I didn't even need to have that explicitly explained to me. I so intuited <laughs> yeah. that it might be, not be wise to interview you in a sheet. And why is it 1 p.m.? I mean, that is bang on soup and snooze hour for me. I, I, have a, I have a little lentil soup and then I have a little nap, right? So now I've had to have my soup at half 12, gobbled that down. It was very hot. <laughs> and the, my nap is postponed till 2 p.m. So this is just some of the hardship that I've been going through during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a, a gruelling tale, even to sit and listen to, <laughs> Ricky, that kind of suffering. It's uh, like the gulag archipelago, listening to some of that stuff. You've got a real mic and everything. Yeah, because I do, like, uh, I've been doing a podcast for for ages, so we put one in the garage, like a little podcast studio. Do you... I'm I went from the only person with a podcast to the only person without one. You're in... So I had to go the other way. <laughs> You're an outlier, a pioneer and an extremist. Yeah. I'm a rebel. You know, I've always been a rebel. It's... Like Tony Hancock. In fact, just like Tony Hancock's Rebel. There's no, there's no question. You're in that lineage. No question. Do you, uh, should we do this little? Should we do this little yeah. interview? Start it officially. I'll start it with like a compliment to put you at your ease. It's really lovely yeah, yeah. to interview you. I'm no, I am very nervous. I can see that you're racked. It with. might be the soup that I drank too quickly. Yeah, esophageal burning and anxiety have similar symptoms. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's lovely to have a proper interview with you. We've had like met a few times. I've never been able to speak to you at depth, but like anyone, I admire you as a comedian very, very much. And I still like watch like a lot of your stuff, like, you know, maybe even just when you're doing Facebook lives, but also like I still watch The Office. I watch uh, Afterlife, checking out the new series, which is what you're, what you're promoting at the moment, doing these like podcasts and that. And it's a real joy to talk to you, Ricky. Thank you. Same, same. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Um, I suppose like, my this... compliment was a lot shorter than yours, wasn't it? <laughs> I didn't give you much back. I felt... I thought it wasn't the place because I feel like a guest. 
You so, are a guest. You are a guest, and in a sense, it's proportionate to our BAFTA backdrops. You, <laughs> you've got endless yeah, masks. Great. I've got a drape. <laughs> right. Let me explain. I've made an effort. I've put a nice little jumper on. I've washed and all that. Mm. But this is this is my desk. I'm at my desk. I, the, my my. This is the smallest room in the house because I thought the echo. Because the other rooms are vast, yeah. and it wouldn't be good for a podcast. No. <laughs> so, okay, this isn't this isn't like cribs where I've hired them. <laughs> I, really, I really did win them. I was watching. I was watching. I remember. I remember a good many of them. Then for I don't know what that boar is. Like there's a wild boar. I guess that's some sort of writing guild, or is it simply an ornament? Oh, no, that's a. Oh, I'm glad you brought that. That's a work of art that um, I that was auctioned for charity, and I gave so generously. That reminds me what a great person I am. It's good to have a memento of your own greatness <laughs> next to those <laughs> less abstract accolades. <laughs> good. I live pretty near where you're from, mate. I, like I so I see sort of like uh, and you're from Reading, and of course, and then like. Aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it's obviously lovely round there. Do you live near here? Um, well, we've got a little place quite near you, um, but uh, my main—I mean, I mean, I'm mostly in leafy Hampstead. Yeah, it, where people like you aren't allowed. If I'm being honest, I was there briefly for a while. I lived on Gardnor Road at what I might call oh, the really? height of my decadence. Yeah, near Flask Walk, and uh, oh, beautiful. Well, like, we used to visit this uh, place, you know, before we lived here. We lived in the centre ever since sort of college. And um, uh, 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 to explaining to Americans what Hampstead is like, I, I, I say it's it's sort of bohemian and eclectic and it's the sort of great, great grandchildren of artists and poets and me, new money. I, I always feel that it was like the Beverly Hillbillies when I rolled into town. <laughs> so, and I think I think I think we're from similar sort of back, backgrounds where we moved where we moved up to be able to live next door to to wealthy people. So I still I still feel when I walk into the Ivy, there's a certain amount of disappointment on people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's incredible, actually. And uh, like, it's sort of a very um, clear in your humour that you have that kind of background. I remember watching Martin Freeman on uh, something once saying that you were the first person he'd met that had a sense of humour that made him laugh like people at school. And I remember when I used to, when you used to do on stuff on 11 o'clock show. And you talked about like, I remember in particular one time when you talked about the apocryphal oft told tale of someone wanking and then opening their eyes and having a cup of tea there. Um, yeah. And like, I guess this was probably 20 years ago, but I remember watching that and thinking, oh, that's funny, man. That's funny. And I suppose, and you've, how, how have you maintained and do you think you've maintained that kind of access to normality and that kind of brittle, spiky working class humour now that you are ensconced on the hill? Well, I, I think, I think I have uh, in, in many ways. Um, obviously, all my family still live around Reading, Wokenham. Thatcher, you know, and they're what you'd call a working class. They're all manual workers or carers. Mm -hmm. And and then there's a, a there's 50, I haven't counted them, sort of great nieces and nephews <laughs> that, you know. Um, and so uh, there, there's there's that. We, you're always connected to your family. You always you always feel at home with your family, you know. Um, uh, so there's there's that. I, I do it, I sort of do it quite consciously, try and remember my roots, because... As a comedian, um, so professionally, I, 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 I sort of do as well. I think because we're court jesters. We have to be court jesters. We have to have low status. We're in the mud with all the other peasants teasing the king. Not too much because we don't want to get killed. But we have to keep our low status somehow, I think. I, I feel I want to. And, and I do that in two ways. And you do this as well. Um, one, I invite them behind the curtain. I go, what, you think it's great being rich and famous? Well, this is what I said in front of the Queen 
this is the first time I've got a private jet. They thought I was the cook. So I, so I do that. I give them the horror stories where I was the putt. I was the wrong person. I shouldn't have been there. Mm. I tell them that. And I, the other way I do it is I talk about things where they're better off than me. I talk about being fat and old and balding. And do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm going to die soon. And I, so you, you do have to, particularly when people know what top comedians earn now, it, it's like um, I sort of embrace that as well. I tease them I, like I did, you know, like uh, talking about my house and wealth in an ironic way. And they get that as well. And I, I, I'm sort of saying, listen, this is luck. I, do you know what I mean? This isn't, I don't think I deserve this. Um, uh, but uh, I think people get it as long as you're honest. It would, it would, when, when, if I see a millionaire comedian going either way, uh, either side of that, like uh, talking down to an audience, that everything's all, is, a, is a battle story that they won, or, you know, they're already, they're already on stage, they're already in an expensive suit or whatever, and, and now they're telling the audience that they're wrong. Again, I do that ironically, but they get it like a mate. I call them scum, and they... They know, they get that I'm saying the opposite. Um, but uh, it would be equally stupid um, when, when I see millionaire comedians going, so I was signing on yesterday and um, I, was on the, I was on the bus. And I'm like, no, you fucking weren't. No, you weren't. You know, but I usually go the other way. Like um, uh, I, I, a typical joke I did in humanity was um, uh, press, they always ask, you know, wealthy entertainers, how much is a pint of milk? Um, so that's meant to show you, you are, and, and I, then I say, I don't know, mm. I haven't checked. But the next time someone asks me, I say, I don't know, maybe it is a grand, run and get me one. <laughs> so I, 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 I sort of embrace my privilege um, for comic effect, I think. The first thing that most of us know you for, it couldn't be a clearer exemplification of authenticity. The office, whether it's the way it was shot, the way that it was scripted, the kind of uh, acute observation of normality and mundanity. So like sort of from the outset, there is a, an authenticity to your work with something that more recent, like Afterlife, which I watched as I was instructed to watch the first couple. It's brilliant. It's, you know, it's perf like someone told me you've got to watch it. I watched uh one and a half, do you know what I mean? And like, a, yeah. and like, a, it's, it's, I've loved the first series. I, I think there's great people in it. I love uh, Roisin. I love that woman, Joe, that's in it. I think it's a really brilliant cast. I love her that's off of Charlie Brooker's stuff as well. She's wicked. Obviously, you're great. Um, like, what uh, are you, do you have the same level of uh, authenticity and uh, sort of, I don't know, candor when you're making something like that? And if so, where are you getting the stuff about? suicide and despair from it's 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 sort of the only thing i care about now more and more every day i wake up and i sort of say um is this is this honest enough is this more true forever i like i'm pe peeling away mm. these layers and i'm going you know, you know it sends you mad because i i, I don't feel that i want to be more famous or richer or win more awards i feel that am i being Am I using my platform to its greatest effect now? Am I being more honest? Am I getting everything off my chest before I die? Am I, am I really, do I really mean this? Am I, I, I can only do things that I'm passionate about because you'll get caught out. So the answer is yes. And um, the, the office, um, uh, I suppose, uh, realism was sort of fortuitous or by accident or, or whatever. Um, because I worked in an office for 10 years, so it was harder for me to get it wrong. You know what I mean? Because uh, I'm directly on going, well, that wouldn't happen, that didn't happen, that wouldn't. So mm. that was easy. I was also emulating something. I, it, was a, it was a fake docu-soap, and I'd watched a lot of those through the 90s where an ordinary person got their 15 minutes of fame. And, uh, you know, it was interesting just being at work. So that was the influences. So it was easy... It was easy to make it real. And, you know, later you find out that we probably cheated less than real documentaries, hmm. particularly by today's standards. We wouldn't have a camera waiting for someone. We wouldn't get them caught doing something unless it was a really elaborate spy or 
they forgot their mic was on. So um, uh, I, I've always been obsessed with um, with realism. All of my favourite things were real, even even to the point that um, uh, I, I, well, the first time I saw a Mike Lee thing, I'm sort of I don't know, thirty four. I just thought this is. I'd never seen this before. People talking over each other. And it wasn't even intimate. It was a, you know, a shoddy old play shot with a few cameras. It wasn't even as good as he, it became. And even in that, even in Abigail's party, which I thought, and I still think is genius, there's one bit that made me feel guilty. That when he says, and it's a great joke, it's a great joke. Um, uh, it goes, uh, Shakespeare, complete works of Shakespeare, leather bound. And they go out and he's showing off and he goes, of course, you couldn't read that sort of thing. And I sort of thought, well, that's a snobby joke. Because you know what? Most people don't. And that's, and is that, is that, are they, is he taking the piss out of my tribe that are trying to better themselves but not quite get it right? And there was still a little flitter of, oh, okay, okay. So when I came to do it myself, I wanted, I did want to embrace that, that, that sort of honest working class thing. I wanted a mix. I like Billy Connolly. I just thought I wanted to be like him, that he, he spoke to his crowd like you do to a mate down a pub. And um, uh, and I remember when I was first, uh, I had a meeting with uh, Channel 4 about the show, even before The Office, when I, I did um, the 11 o'clock show. And, uh, and the big thing there was um, Chris Morris and Brass Eye which I thought, I still think is amazing. Um, but it's also very sort of, uh, it's very sort of guardian-y, isn't it? It's not like, do you know what I mean? Uh, it's but the people who love it. Uh, uh, and I thought, I want to I wanna mix that sort of comedy and that sort of, I suppose, pursuit of excellence and intellect, but make it sort of accessible. And so... I remember I turned the, I want to do, <laughs> um, I, was, I was talking to someone and um, uh, I said, I sort of want to bring that to the working classes, which sounds very patronising, early days. But I felt that, you know, my family didn't watch Brass Eye. I felt like I was part of the media loving something. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. I understand the idea of sort of uh, cultural elitism and esotericism. And I feel like, like, you know, you obviously have an incredibly refined uh, sense of humour and at the risk of bolstering a compliment that I've already given you that was scarcely reciprocated. I feel like you're a genius, uh, like in a like proper Hancock, Cleese, Coogan kind of lineage and even though your background is sort of marked by ordinariness and ordinariness and the sort of gentle beauty of the ordinary is obviously something that captivates you there is something alienating first I think about that kind of insight that you have and I, I and I would offer also secondarily by becoming very successful and I, I wonder about how you like what how you've experienced alienation both prior to success and subsequent to it. Also bearing in mind, like, you know, like prior to your uh, comedy career, you know, the stuff with the new romantic looking 20 year old Ricky Gervais stuff. And also remember, I did mention to you about suicide and despair earlier. So if you can just have an answer that covers all of that territory. Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I don't know if I've. I, I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever suffered from any of those more chronic conditions. Of I, I don't, I've never, I've never really felt that alienated, or I've never suffered from terrible anxiety or depression without cause. You know, I've had, I've had mm. grief. You know, loved ones die and all that. Um, uh, growing up, I just. I mean, I, did, I didn't know I was poor and working class till I was 14, 15. I didn't, do you know what I mean? We're all in the same boat. I went to a comprehensive school. Um, I was, you know, I was, I was smart, so I was in the top few there. I always, I always felt I'd go to university. I just, that, 
Do you know what I mean? I never felt everything's out of my reach. I never thought it won't happen to you, mm. um, which is odd. Yeah. It, I don't know why I had that confidence. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I'm remembering it wrong. Maybe it was bravado. Or maybe I just thought that's the only way to do it, academia. Um, uh, it's so funny because... You know, 500 years ago, to move through a class, you know, you had to be a great warrior and you might get a knighthood, but that was very rare and dangerous. Then the industrialists started, you know, finding coal and, or, you know, prospectors went and found gold and they moved up and they moved into neighbourhoods like mine. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they became wealthier than the wealthy. But in our sort of lifetime, it, I suppose the, the last group to do it were was it's pop pop culture. It, you know, it's, it's it's footballers and pop stars where you know you suddenly heard working class and regional accents, and they were in mansion houses and driving Rolls Royces into pools, which I'm sure you've done, but I never would. I'd go, that's a waste. But let's get you. Know, um, so. Uh, so I'm going to tell you, we can we can fix this. We can fix this. <laughs> um, so I'm sort of aware of all those things, but I never, I never felt it. I was never conscious of it. You know, uh, I suppose the first time I went for an interview at university, that's when I heard people who sounded a bit like the Queen, and I hadn't heard that accent. It might, you know, my teachers were working class. Mm -hmm. It's like everything. <laughs> they were working class. They were lads. They were working class lads in a in a comprehensive school in Reading. Um, so that's when I you started mixing with um, people, uh, uh, you know, of, of difference uh, in, in in class and wealth. And um, I remember meeting someone. He, he he didn't know what a supermarket was, and I thought he was winding me up. I thought he was winding me up. Um, and I guess I, I played it a bit because in my first year I, I gave myself a skinhead and I loved the fact that I was ID going into the college and I could show my so I, I definitely played and I, I remember I wore my dad's old uh, lame donkey jacket in 19 <laughs> yeah 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 oh, hi guys I'm working class I'm one of the six percent hi guys <laughs> you know what I mean it's like <laughs> um, but uh, what was the last part of the question? Have I? Well, I guess about, I was sort uh, of talking about like you've sort of explained didn't feel alienated, but like, but you also don't it seems like you you wore literally your class as a badge and didn't feel inferiority. And like, I suppose like you know a character like David Brent, like who's like under all this sort of excruciating social pressure and wants to better himself on camera, yes. right through to uh, the protagonist in Afterlife dealing with despair. Like it's like. In your like, and and of course your obsession with uh, authenticity. I wonder where in your own life is it something that's very private to you? Feelings of well, pain it's because it it does go into your art, but sometimes you know I, I'm I'm very keen for people to know that they 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 shouldn't use every joke as a window to the soul of the comedian because sometimes I I make a joke or. A, a routine that is the opposite of what I feel because it makes the joke better. And I, I'm very, I'm militant about people going. Listen, it, it, it sometimes it's, ju it really is just a joke, and sometimes yeah. it's the opposite of what I believe. I start with my, my super nature. So I, I do a sort of a, 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 a an off colour joke, and they go, oh, they groan, and I go, well, that was irony, you see, because that's when I say something I don't really mean, and you as an audience laugh at the wrong thing because you know what the right thing is. It's a way to, and I sort of, and they get it, and then I, I, I call back that sometimes I do. I go, no, don't let me down now. Remember what we said. So I'm playing with those 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 constraints and misunderstandings. But um, your first point is that, that, that David Brent, um, he was sort of on that cusp. I was fascinated that that Cleese did it a little bit with with Faulty Towers. Where you know it was he was it, it, he was sort of lower middle class, and you know he wanted to uh, his aspiration was Buckingham Palace. Whereas by the time I got around to doing the office, the new aspiration was Beckingham Palace. 
it was that sort of level. You know what I mean? I want to be on telly. Mm. That whatever I want to be on telly. I want to be famous, and it was just creeping in then. Um, and it was a, a very important part of the office. Without it being a fake documentary, that is a very boring average sitcom. <laughs> there's some jokes. There's some great performances. But if you don't know why this man is acting like that, you've lost 50% of what's funny and tragic about that. And he, you're right, he's trying to move. Just like Basil Fawlty, he's trying to move, right? But he's doing it for the same reasons, right? And you, all this bullshit, I want that, I want this, we need that, we have to do this, but it all comes down to one thing, right? It's being happy. It's being happy with yourself and having, and and then what's being happy? Well, there's, there's so many boxes to tick. And the one people forget is worth. It's the, it's absolutely massive. It's worth. And um, so all those things went into David Brent, but he basically needed a hug. And I remember in the days when you were in every paper and doing every interview, right? <laughs> You, you, someone said, what's your favourite thing? And you said, um, The Office. Uh, and there was a picture of David Ben. And uh, you talked about David Ben. And you said, it's beautiful. It's sad. And it is. And I, I'm, I'm by the, uh, and I, I remember that one of the first times I'd read that someone, it is sad, um, because he needs a hug. That's all, that's all he's doing. He's, he's saying, am I good enough? Do you love me yet? And it's fucking tragic. And when you know that, I think you like David Brent. Yeah. I think you like him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always did. One of my favourite lines, I like that, um, I was thinking about it recently, that uh, that's, um, good, that's not good news and bad news, that's good news and irrelevant news. And you go, <laughs> that's not a phrase though, is it? <laughs> but, now, but now that level of narcissism is mediocre. Now, now we have leaders saying things like that. The bad news is that the pandemic, the good news is I'm, uh, I've, I'm up three in the polls. You know, it's like, it, it really, and it just got worse and worse. I had to really up my game um, for life on the road because it had been 15 years. And now David Brent w- wasn't even that odd or annoying <laughs> compared to, do you know what I mean? People on The Apprentice who, who, yeah. who say, I will destroy anyone who stands in my way. That is like an unwritten law with the producers going, let me on and I'll behave badly for Big Brother contestants. Let me in there and I'll, I'll start a fight and take my clothes off. Okay, you promise? Yeah, 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 yeah. With this, this, this obsession with seeing normal people destroy themselves. Some of them, some of, I don't know how some of them passed the, the medical exam because some of them, they shouldn't be in there and it's not good for them. No. This thing where people keep going back to fame and going, do you love me yet? No, they don't love you. They want you to fail. It, it's, oh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. there's a kind of, uh, like, there's been a, a glorification of idiocy in culture, and it seems like that's something that still annoys you, that the, the, uh, that sort of uh, celebration of stupidity. And it seems like a lot of what you're saying, it like, is that you're very a grounded person. Like you said, like, you know, my role is a jester. I don't want to get out of my box. So, you know, you can tease the king, but don't start, like, you know, trying to grab the crown or anything. Um, yeah. Uh, but, like, um, what about, like, how... What is... Um, see, with the... Um, there's two areas I want to talk to you about. One, your deep, deep love of animals. And two, your uh, obvious, very public and uh, articulate atheism. Uh, like, uh, like, and, and I'll sort of talk about how I see those things as correlative, you know. I suppose as we as we go on about it. But like, um, firstly, have you always been like that with the animals? Yeah, well, that's yeah. I mean, I don't remember not loving animals. I mean, you know, I was born into uh, a, a family with um, with pets, and uh, uh, it, it was all. I, mean, I remember when I was. Uh, when I was a kid, my brother was ten years older than me, and um, he got in trouble, right, for punching a bloke in the park. And my mum, all my mum wanted of us really was to not us to go to jail or die in a barroom fight. Do you know what I mean? That was it. Was, it was an international comedian? Just don't die. 
before me, you know. <laughs> and um, and uh, so he must have been. I don't know. It was it was an adult, and uh, she went, "Why did you punch him for?" And he went, "He kicked the dog." And my mum went, "Oh, all right." <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the, my first bit of you know street justice. But yeah, um, I, I, you know, my, uh, my mum loves animals. We always had a dog and a cat. And I remember five, six, seven years old. I was just out in the garden all the time. Just look, I was just I was fascinated with the world. I wanted to know everything about the world. What what where did this um, animal evolved from what's what's he connected to I, I, I just wanted to I, I wanted it all I, I mean lear, I suppose learning was my first love but science and nature I've always been fascinated with it I still am um, it's always been a, a privilege it, it makes me feel good I don't know why an animal makes me I'm in awe of an animal you know and uh, even down to you know um, um, our, our cat died uh, recently but it was like if that cat was sat on me it's our cat right if we own it right as much as you can um it was still a privilege that that cat wanted to sit on me i think what a privilege that is uh, and and i i can't stress enough that we're and uh, i know you uh, totally agree with this but we're just part of nature we're not above it we're 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 nothing special we're not as important as bees we're not as important as bees, right? Let's, let's let that sink in, you know? So, yeah, I absolutely love animals. And, and, and my, my big hate out of all of everything about, you know, preservation and nature and you know, this species and that species is, is still animal cruelty. I don't get it. I don't know why. I don't know the pleasure. I'm worried about the psychology of people who... who you know, and, and there's a there's a scale, obviously. There's a weird scale from sort of serial killer to people who just don't think they're they're worth worrying about that much, you know. Mm. Um but yeah, I've never I've never it keeps me away. It's the only thing that makes my blood boil and, yeah. and keeps me awake at night, you know, and now we've got Twitter and you do what you can. It, I, I, there's not a day go by when someone doesn't send me something and I go, Oh, I wish that wasn't in my head. But it is, so I've got to do something now, you know? Yeah, yeah. I suppose there must be, like, people that are, don't, well, and people that are capable of being cruel to animals, it seems, I would guess, is a kind of rupture between that person and their sort of knowledge of us all sort of feeling pain, a kind of a sort of an impeded compassion or something, an inability yeah. to feel. And I mean, there's something, yeah, you're right, there's something wrong with someone who actually enjoys seeing an animal in pain. I mean, that is... That's one end of the scale, you know. But then there's people who are in denial. You know, there's people, there's lots of propaganda out there why it's okay, why, I, I, you know, why bullfighting's okay. Because um, it's a, it's an honourable way for the bull to die. Shut up. Because it's tradition. Well, so was slavery and child sacrifice. It's like, it's culture, it's not culture, right? It, it's like what, I don't get it. I don't. I don't get it. And the things that then you find out the things behind it, right? This fucking sequin with a sword, right? They've, they've already drugged the fucking ball. They cut the tendons on the back of his neck. They fucking blunt the, let's keep it fair. Let's send him it. Honestly, why have you done this to me? Why have you done <laughs> Yeah. I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't get it. I reckon a lot of um, the problems that we're experiencing in the world, like right across the scope of our conversation so far, whether it's people craving fame, adulation, celebrity approval, or people being uh, uh, cruel to animals, I, I reckon much of it can be derived from a sense of being separate from nature, whether that's inner nature or outer nature, like that people see themselves as isolated, alienated individuals that you, they're making their own luck in the world and live sort of in a, uh, a world uh, extracted from meaning or de devoid of meaning. And this is where um, I suppose I'm interested in uh, the way that you, I, I know because I've listened to your stuff, like that your atheism began when you sort of saw your mum like go, don't say that to your brother when you was like a kid um, about like, you know, as if like, and that Jesus was a sort of a kind of baby, an additional babysitter and an omnipresent sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> nanny of the estate. But, exactly. Like, but like, yeah. but but like, cause like I spend a, 
Cos C, I spend a lot of time, I suppose. Uh, I'm solipsistic, narcissistic person. You know, have been through the mill with addiction, with fame and sex and drugs and money and all that kind of stuff. And it's placed me in a, a point where I've had to open myself up to different ideas. I imagine if you and I talked about institutional or orthodox religion and the way that it is structured and the way that power is deployed, prejudice enacted, violence yes. underwritten, I reckon we'd probably agree. But one of the things that I feel is that, that my own love of animals and also my cat did die uh, last week sadly he was also 16 yeah, because no, Jenny told yeah. me um, and it like I was so affected by it I was more I was surprised by the amount of grief and sadness that I yeah. felt like it took me apart I'd let it hit me full on we buried yeah. him in the garden I dug a hole I got in, into it there was only one self-indulgent bit everything was sincere except for one moment Ricky I did smear soil on my face as a sort of expression of deep grief Whatever gets you through. That's what I needed to do. That's that's just no, me expressing no, no, myself. Well done. And and I think the way you're going is that um uh, I seem a spiritual person, but not literally, and that's totally true. That uh, I, I, I'm in as much awe at seeing a tree or a mountain or a bird or a river as anyone who thinks God made it. I I, I am in I. I see the beauty of nature, and I think most. And I, I don't. I don't know this, but you're right. There's a huge difference between spirituality. There's something to the south that gets you through. That you that you want to. You want to know the reason. You want to connect. All those things. I feel all those things with, without the belief in a god or gods. Religion's something else. Religion. Religion basically says you. You want to get into heaven. I know. I know him. You just got to do this shit for me, mm. and we're cool. You know. We, we know that, that everything that's ever started was 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 written by usually a man with an agenda. You know, it's like it's no coincidence all those rules in the Old Testament sort of favour certain men. In the certain, there's no, it's not a coincidence. You know, and and the same with you know, it, it's a, it, it's no coincidence that if you're born in America, you're probably Christian, if you're born in India, probably a Hindu, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We know that, but if we're talking about spirituality, um, uh, I'm all for it. It's never bothered me. It's never someone believe in God has never bothered me. It's what do you do with it? If you start saying to me, I, I you know, um, I love this prophet or that prophet, and I love God, I go good. Fine, yeah, and I do this, and I believe. Oh, great, yeah, put it. And I think we should throw homosexuals off buildings. Well, no, now, <laughs> now, now we've got a, now we've got a talk. Now we've got a talk, right? Just you know, um, so it's when there's suddenly an agenda that that coincidentally favours the person. You know, it's when people have exactly. Luckily, God agrees with them. Yeah, <laughs> all there, all there. yeah, but, uh, yeah. I, I've absolutely. And um, and I think it was started with good intentions. Um, in the invention of lying, when my character invents religion, he does it because he can't stand his mum's fear of death. And and I remember when my mum was dying. If she asked me, I was thinking I was going to lie. I was like, yeah, there probably is because if that, you know, I I, I probably would have. So um, uh, I think people there's so many myths about atheism. We can go into the the definitions and all that, but I think it's worse. People think that atheists run into churches and ruin people's days. You know, it's all bollocks. It's nothing spread than the truth. I, um, people ask me, say, "Have you ever been in a church?" I go, "Yeah, yeah. It's, it's lovely buildings. I love them." What, what do you mean? You know, it, it's this. I don't, I don't know where it comes from. And also, technically, atheism doesn't even mean uh, you you don't believe in God, it means that, sorry, you believe there's no God, it means that you just haven't found God yet, you, you know, there's no evidence, and that that is true, but it's, you know, core, and I've explained this many times, that technically, I'm an agnostic atheist, because one deals with knowledge, and one deals um, with belief, so no one knows, if we agree that, that no one knows, we're all atheists, so now, what do you think, and Believers say, I think there is a God. And atheists think, I don't think there is a God because I haven't got any evidence yet. So that is all is all I'm saying. Um, as you say, religion is something else to belief and spirituality. And um, 
you know, uh, 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 and if people even say to me, um, if someone proved there was a God, would you believe? I go, well, of course I would. Well, well, it wouldn't even be belief, it would be knowledge. You know, it would also be the greatest discovery ever. Forget, let's cancel the Nobel site from now on. He's discovered God. <laughs> That's, it's done. And I think if, if the, you know, um, and that would change everything, I think. Uh, but until we know, I, I just don't, I, I don't want to li- live my life um, uh, by a belief in something that I have no evidence in. That's all. That's that's all I'm saying. And I, and I sometimes say to people that, you know, um, uh, a, a, a good Christian or a good Muslim or a good Jew or whatever is someone who does all the good bits in their holy book and ignores the bad bits. And I say, if you already know right from wrong, you don't need the book. And, and, and you know, you have to cherry pick. Um, and uh, we know that the bad believers are the ones that do the bad bits too <laughs> you know um so for me it's it's uh, it is personal i just happen not to believe in god I, I used to but now i've thought about it and i i feel like i don't need a god um uh, but the, the the thing that i really object to is people assuming that you can't be a good person if you don't believe in a god which which is proved over and over again. And I've tweeted things um, like, um, uh, there are good atheists and bad atheists. There are good Christians and bad Christians. And a God has never changed that. And all I'm saying is, I get it. It doesn't, this is not me going, it, it, it works both ways. You shouldn't judge people by their beliefs. You should judge them mm. by their actual behaviour. You know, mm. right and wrong. You know, some people believe the right thing, but don't do the right thing, and vice versa. And I, I just think I feel I don't need it. I just don't need a structured guidebook outside, at, you know, my, my own morality. And morality is relative and not absolute. And you, you'd have to keep dogma is the problem. I think dogma is the real problem, and it's not just in religion anymore. It's creeping into everything. It's creeping into politics, and it's creeping into you know, identity politics. It's creeping into um, so, just social um, structures and opinions. It's, it's you know, if, if anyone says to me, "This is what shouldn't be questioned," fuck that. No, let's um, no, no, let's question it. <laughs> let's, that's the red rag to a ball. You know what? Don't quit. I've always been like that. I've always been like teachers. If someone said that, I, I'll always. Even a board game, I think. What are the rules? Can I, can I get out of my win within the rules? <laughs> yeah. I've gone on a sort of like the opposite journey in that I feel like I started off atheistic just the same way that I would reject any attempt to impose regulation or control on me for the purposes of domination. And but like as I've you know gone through my own stuff with you know addiction and mental health or whatever it is, and and like I know that you're very um like you know that for example afterlife is about legitimate grief as opposed to some kind of abstract idea of mental illness brought about by hormonal or neurological balance but myself my own sense of despair uh, particularly looking at it from a perspective of uh, mental health issues and addiction is that there is an unaddressed yearning for a kind of oneness togetherness and uh, and like you know to, to, to your point earlier about brent in indeed for love and when like you talk about that sense of awe of uh, like the appreciation of a, an animal the love of an animal and the sort of regard and gratitude for having an animal love you and care for you or the beauty of nature or the deep deep beauty of the cosmos what i feel like and my own uh, appreciation understanding stroke belief in god is is that there is a kind of in the love of it in the awareness of rightness itself there is an indication that there is such a thing as rightness not that there any one particular group or ideology has unique a particular and special access to it and and i really firmly deeply believe that spirituality is for me not for me to tell other people boy i don't reckon you should be gay or I don't reckon you should be allowed to do it like I feel like it's I do my shit in the Bible in the Bible it says you should pray secretly oh wow so yeah 
Yeah, like there um, is something sort of but, deeply private about it. But I also think, Ricky, that there is a social consequence to... Um, I don't necessarily want to say atheism because I completely agree with your point that there's good and bad, you know, in like beyond those kind of limited taxonomies. But like, I do feel like when people think there's no purpose or meaning... That and that needn't necessarily be just because of a belief in God, that it creates cultures that are oddly materialistic, nihilistic. And I feel like in the last 20 years, we're seeing more and more worship of self, worship of individual. Well, of course, there's a new narcissism, of course. And, uh, and, and um, I, I don't know why I think social media is, is, is partly to blame. I think people being rewarded for bad behaviour is partly to blame, you know, magazines or TV or whatever. I did a speech in the Big Brother House as Andy Millman in extras, and uh, again, that was at the that was at the beginning of it, and and now it's got worse. But a um, couple of points: I, I do think there's a, a, a people um, crave a oneness, um, even if we don't have an understanding about why we're here. Because again, that's very human. We're inquisitive. We want to know why. We want the answer why. And some people don't accept. We don't know yet, but we're on the way. They don't. They got no. Well, they, um, that's no. You know, the god of the gaps. We 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 understand that. Well, if I if you don't know, explain it. God did it. Okay, well, that doesn't really solve anything. Even down to the, uh, I put a joke in afterlife where cats bothering me, and she says, uh, "How did it all come from? Someone from nothing." And uh, I go, "Well, uh, uh, where did it all come from then?" She goes, "God made it." I go, "Okay, where did God come from?" She went, "He's always been around." I go, "Simple as that, isn't it?" So. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't answer the question, but I get it. And I think, I think, um, apart from people wanting there to be some sort of um, divine justice, because you know, that would be great. Good people would be rewarded and bad people would be punished. Brilliant. OK, it, does, it, it doesn't work like that. You know, you only have to look at, um, uh, you know, children in Africa being born with cancer. and You know, we, we know that's not... We know mysterious ways isn't an explanation, okay? Um, uh, that, that, to me, is someone who doesn't know the answer and says mysterious ways. But apart from that, you're right. We're seeking the answer. Why are we here? Um, I think we think that, hold on, well, it's too good. It's too good to be chance. It's, everything's perfect. Well, it seems that way. You know, it's like Douglas Adams' puddle you know, when it imagines this, I fit this whole one perfectly. Um, uh, but I think you're right. We're, we are scared and alone. And we, the, the, the idea of death is, is horrible. What, you'll never exist again. What was the point? Um, and again, I, I talk about this in, uh, in Afterlife One, where I, I, I say, um, um, Kath's, saying that uh, if you if, if think it's, you know, um, there's no heaven, why don't you kill yourself? And I say, so if you're watching a really good film, but you know it's going to end, you might as well just stop it. She went, no, because I can't watch it again. And I say, I think that's the amazing thing about life. You can't watch it again. You know, one day you'll hug, uh, you know, your, your mum for the last time. You'll smell your last flower. You'll eat your last meal. You won't know it's your last, but it will be your last. And so you've got to make the most of everything. And it is a terrifying prospect. It is kind of sad that you will never exist again, I, I think. But it doesn't mean it's not true. You know, the bottom line is I can't believe something I don't believe. And so how do I find meaning? Well, we are here. We are here. The chances of us being us, you being you and me being me, existing now, that sperm hitting that egg is 400 trillion to one. You know, we're not special, but we are lucky. We do exist. It's incredible. And I think of it, it's like a holiday. We don't exist for 13 and a half billion years. Then we, we, we explode into this mass, this electronic blob of thought, introspection, love, hate, fear, beauty, horror for 80, 90, 100 years if we're lucky. Then we die and we never exist again. We return, our atoms return, and it carries on. Right? And that's not scary because I think people are scared of death because they don't know what's beyond. And someone said to me, well, what, do you, what do you think it feels like when you die? And I say, like the 13 and a half billion years before I was born. And that was all right. Hmm. So, but 
we but the big thing is injecting meaning i think you're totally right i think you're totally right it, when you start thinking about it, it why are we here well um i mean it, 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 not even the how but why well to live your life to the fullest and not and not hurt anyone to leave the world in a better place than it was when you came into it to to experience everything all the reasons all the obvious reasons you know love wine dogs learning um all these great things that you can do every minute of every day that you're alive and then you then you check out you go i'm done thanks and it's and it's done and it's beautiful it's fucking beautiful it is beautiful but I was struck when you said that by a few things. One is like this sort of like the injection of meaning as in, you know, like meaning would have to be imported f- externally, fabricated somehow, invented. Whereas I think on some level, I feel that there is that meaning is inhered and that the, the meaning is in the kind of zeal that you have when you describe the things that give you love, pleasure, um, you know, connection, whether it's wine or dogs or whatever. I, 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 I've had like some some experiences like through meditation and when I, I took drugs too young and now, so I'm now I'm not allowed to do ayahuasca or LSD or them things that I would definitely be doing if I wasn't in recovery. But I had like those sort of these experiences that were a kind of, I would say a sort of an evaporation of self and yet a continued awareness. I know that my consciousness is connected to my biology, but I have a sense somewhat derived from uh, the sort of the fact that, you know, you can't trace how, um, you know, mechanical parts ever become conscious, that consciousness may be elemental somehow. Now, that like, that doesn't point to a god in a traditional patriarchal or domineering sense, but it sort of points to an, a, an element that's very difficult to quantify, whether that's the deep intelligence of nature, the deep mathematics of biochemistry and biology, biology and the essential mystery of consciousness itself, you know, commonly referred to as the, the hard problem. And through these sort of individual experiences, whilst I've not had anything that you would call typically religious, Jesus emerging out of a tunnel, Ganesh lashing around or any of that sort of stuff, what I've had is like a well it's highly bloody interpretive because say there's this one breath thing I do you breathe you breathe from the abdomen very aggressively and then you sort of take a sharp inhale and you normally you nearly well a medical man would say what you're doing there is hyperventilating and nearly passing out but from the inside what it feels like is bloody hell for this moment I'm aware and I'm not me what is this what is this is there a possibility that my awareness your awareness the awareness of all animals and and and, and an awareness that's impossible to read is somehow present in all nature in all matter and if that's true then there's a kind of a real a genuine cohesion and togetherness between all of the beings of the earth and beyond and like and those people that can't actually enjoy the lives that we are privileged to have of the red wine or the dogs or whatever like i'm not saying that's some sort of comfort to them but in fact those of us that are in privileged position might feel newly incentivized to work towards a different kind of society and system that is more reflective of those values now that doesn't necessarily require monotheism pantheonism or any of those things but it is somewhat underwritten by a kind of a sameness or and a oneness and how that might relate to justice and also there is a sort of a a personal experience of of mystery in it i wonder what you feel about that and if you're curious about psychedelics and that kind of awkward states Uh, and that uh, well um you know i love i love a good mystery and you're right um uh, it is a mystery science all science it does is, is it's a discipline that follows the evidence and what science keeps saying and some people say this is a flaw that it's been wrong before. Well, science never been wrong before. Our interpretation, science has been wrong before. You know, it, it, uh, science is just a, is, is a way to look and understand the, the, the physical um, universe. And what science says, it keeps saying, okay, this is the least wrong theory we've got so far. And then the next day it goes, okay, we're even less wrong today. We were... We were less wrong today. You know, they've mapped the beginning of the universe to to a fraction of a second, which is pretty close. But um, so uh, I, I think science keeps proving itself over and over again. And, and the fact that we don't understand, you know, the, the mind-body problem completely yet, um, that is the beauty. And the more we understand, the more questions 
it, it throws up. It's like, um, you know, people say the missing link. Uh, like there's, 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 there's this fossil and there's this fossil, and uh, we find that one. And people go, no, there's two missing links. Hmm. So you can't win, you know. And um, all science can do is just keep filling the gaps and finding and finding new gaps. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, I, I, I think that um, it is it is it's amazing what intelligence is. What uh, you know, I, I, I'm a determinist, which changes nothing. I, I, I believe that free, free will is an illusion. So be it. If it feels like it, it might as well be. Um, but to then to analyse it and go, well, we're uh, we're, we're we're machines. We we are machines. We are machines. Um, we, we're machines trying to understand ourselves, and that's hard. Will will there one day be a computer that is suffering from anxiety? I reckon so. Hmm. I reckon so. I reckon there'd be a genius computer that's worried about shit. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the same. We're, we're, we're lumps of meat. We're, we're chimps with brains the size of a planet. Of course we go mad and try and kill each other and worry about what's the point. Of course we do. It's, it's overwhelming. And the more you think about it, the more frightening it is. So um, it, it, I just think that, um, you know, my new, my new show, Supernature, I start with saying it's called Supernature for two reasons. One... I want to debunk the supernatural. I don't believe in anything supernatural. I think that anything that, that exists is by definition part of nature and is explainable. If not now, then eventually. And also, supernature, because nature is super enough. We don't need angels in unicorns. We've got the fucking octopus. And then I go into, you know, we don't, we don't need to look. I feel we don't need to look elsewhere. That doesn't mean I'm not in awe of poetry and intelligence and you know I, I just don't think that unweaving the rainbow spoils it I think it makes it more exciting when I see when I see a card trick and I don't know how it's done and then the magician tells me I can't wait for him to show someone else who doesn't know how it's done and how it's done is more exciting for me just do, do you know what I mean yes Yes, I do, and and I also sort of don't believe in magic, you know that that kind of stuff. I but what one of the things I spoke to Neil deGrasse Tyson about was, oh. uh, yeah, that dude, he's amazing, isn't he? Like I spoke to him about the sort well, of quantum physics, all bets are off. We can we can talk like this till we're blue in the face, and then quantum physics comes along, and. There's that saying: if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics. Yeah, it's magic. It might quantum physics by all our definitions of science and nature, right? And we're intelligent people. We've read a bit. We think, right? We've got a good brain. We've got as good a brain as anyone. But fuck quantum physics. It's mental. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes it sort of seems what I, I like that came up in our conversation and i ex- sort of used it to illustrate my feeling that the the limitations of our senses and the limitate and our and our the limitations of our capacity to handle knowledge mean that there will always be a realm beyond knowledge that uh, all scientific disciplines are contingent upon application amplification of existing senses microscopic telescopic even you um, calculating devices like ai uh, and that that the 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 the, the, the I've got, i reckon i don't see like uh, quantum physics as woo type magic but i do no, see it as not, an no. indication of fucking hell there is an it- intelligence just, at it's work it's just we can't you know like some people say you can't understand it like God can understand it because you haven't got God's brain. Well, that is quantum physics to me. You know, the fact that it's, it happens means it exists and it's true and it's scientific. But then to ask us to understand it, now we've, we've, that's a big ask. Because it's, it's incredible, just the uncertainty principle, the fact that I want it to be metaphor. I want it to go, we don't literally mean it's in two places at once. I go, yeah, we do, because the way that time is... Right, 
start again, right? Right, I've got two potatoes. <laughs> 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 it's it's because yeah, it's it's a it, and usually it's the scale of things that we can't fathom, you know. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not true. And if it's true, if it's true, it's real. It, it's as simple as that for me. And and I know that that sounds like that sounds like a linguistic trick for me to get away without actually feeling that I understand it. But it doesn't make it not true. And that's all I think. The fact that I don't understand something doesn't mean it's not understandable. Mm. I wouldn't be so arrogant as to think that, because I don't understand um, uh, consciousness and uh, the fact that the, uh, the universe is expanding. It doesn't mean it's not true. Um, so I, I think I've always got that get out clause. I don't have to leap for a being did it, a different being on a different plane and level made it. I don't, I, that's all I don't know. And I think that most people would be satisfied if you sat them down and said, all those things that you think God did, right, he did, he just doesn't have a will like you think he does. He's just nature. Yes. And I think some people would be happy with that, I think. Yes, because will is like, you know, if, as much as I can understand, it's strongly related to my individual imperatives, which are based on survival, which are therefore material, need to procreate, need to food, have food, need to have shelter, need to die. So will, however it might uh, ex- refract through a culture that no longer requires of me that I seek shelter or find food, you know, like all our, all culture is coming from this place. And I think when we're talking about the absolute, whether we're talking about it in sort of materialistic scientific terms or spiritual or even religious terms, it's not going to be something that we can comprehend and understand. And I've always used that as a kind of rebuttal to the idea of why do bad things happen? Because I feel like in this, we are on such a narrow bandwidth of all potential realities, of all potential understandable forms and, and unforms that our notions of good and bad are inhibited. We are, we are beyond that. Yes. Well, this is a, a, another point. Again, I put it in. I put it in afterlife as a bit of a joke. Where Kath says to me, "If we, if you don't believe in God and heaven and all that, why don't you just go out raping and murdering as much as you want?" And I say, <laughs> "I do, I do," which is not at all. And that's a scary prospect that some people, because they think in absolute morality, they think that there's no point in being good without a God. And that's a that's a big that's quite a big school of thought that people take that to the nth degree. They go, you know, and, and my, my worry is that if you're only not murdering because you think God's watching, that's that's scary. Yeah, like <laughs> it's the purge. You know, if if that's what stops you murdering, then yeah, okay, that's that's whatever whatever gets you through. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I, I don't believe in absolute morality because I think that we invented morality to, as, as a code to live by so we could all be as happy as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there, are, there are different laws for different times and different species, you know. The, 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 the law of the spider is not the same as the law of as the human. We know that. If I'm starving, I don't eat my own legs. <laughs> <laughs> and we make we don't bite the head of the partner afterwards. So it, it, it's a nonsense to 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 try and equate uh, morality with 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 nature and and spirituality and religion. It it is because people got together and decided that the best way to live. You know that's 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 a society more than anything. And 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 morality existed before any god, in my opinion, before any god. Uh, you know, and they they just took the golden rule, which I love. I love, but it's not religions that you know do as you would be done by. And I think it's a it's 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 a it's a really good rule of thumb. And it would, and if everyone did that, the world would instantly be a better place um, w- without without any god in, interference. And the other one that I've come to love, my, probably my favourite piece from the Bible that everyone's forgotten, and I see it more and more in the last. 10, 15 years, and particularly on social media, is let um, those amongst you 
who was without sin cast the first stone. And I tell you, that shut that would shut so many fucking people up. Uh, you know, despite what people think of me, I'm not a very judgmental person in my life. But I'm not, I'm, I, I go whatever. You know, what, good good luck to him. You know, I always try and see. I even try and empathise with what you'd call bad people. I think, well, why do they do that? I, I, I'm always willing to. I'd, I'd be a judge going, I promise you won't do it again. You know, I would, okay, let, I, I, you know what I mean? I, I really do, you know, one, one uh, better, better a thousand guilty go free than one innocent person, you know? Um, but um, I, I, we do have to, we do have to have these societal laws for the benefit of everyone. And, and in, the irony is that a secular society would defend all rights to religious belief more than any one religion does. Um, but it's all it's saying is let's not make it law, let's not make superstition law, let's not and it's so funny, I see it, I see the I see the hypocrisy in a so called Christian um, country, free country, uh, who hate the idea of this this fundamentalist state but they're doing the same it's just that theirs is a different god they're doing it with you're the same you're the same you think yeah. god is on your side and you can you can you know your tribe can rule so yeah i, I you know I, unlike all religions I, I i treat all religions equally yes and um, what about though uh, secularism is some degree underwritten by economic ideologies and I, I would say sort of social systems that in a way behave precisely as religions do in that they inhibit impede. That's, I, I, I don't agree with that at all because all secularism says that we want to we want to separate church from state that you know you don't you don't base any laws on a particular belief in a particular god. Or a religion, you know that that's that's all it's really saying, isn't it? It, it? And you know what? In in the the the, the freest, most liberal, um, sensible site is it? It is secular, really. But some people go to church, and that's fine. Hmm. Doesn't bother anyone. But on a, on a on a on a, uh, a an exam with biology, physics and chemistry, the answer isn't God did it. That's all. That's all a secular society insists. You know, this works. Biology works. Physics works. It, it, it works over and over again. Um, it, it's, just, it's just induction. Um, but I, I would... I said, um, if you could, would you ban religion? I go, no, I, I honestly wouldn't. I honestly wouldn't ban religion. In fact, if someone started banning someone the right to believe in whatever God I'd march going let them believe in that God it's your right to believe in whatever I, I honestly I'd fight for anyone's right to believe in in God goblins witches you know just don't throw homosexuals off buildings and we're fine yeah <laughs> I think in the end it becomes God and good become synonymous in any meaningful ideology that, that there is a kind of yeah. a sense of harmony and as best possible fairness and non-intervention well it's all it's it's all i've got well, you know i've lost the working class thing now so all i've got is um atheism as my oppression there's 13 countries where i'd be put to death and in america <laughs> we were voted least trustworthy group along with rapists so I've always got AT. I'm oppressed, Russell. I'm oppressed. <laughs> In that case, I'm on your side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, wicked, Ricky. Yeah. We've we done an hour there, mate. That's uh, an Wow, hour. it's my nap time. Yeah, that's where you could go back into your carefully guarded rituals of soup and whatever else it is that holds you together in your godless, nihilistic expanse. Well, I'd just like to say, I'll give you the compliment. I'm so, it's so lovely to see you well and all grown up, not sitting there in a sheet but in real proper clothes, <laughs> and I, I couldn't be prouder. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, mate. That's a, I will uh, I'll carry that. <laughs> Thanks, man.
Thank you very much. If you enjoyed that conversation, go over to luminarypodcast.com now and sign up for a, a week's free trial and listen to the many, many fantastic conversations that I've had on this platform. Simon Amstel being but one of them. Who did we do recently that I was well into? David Eagleman, absolutely fantastic. I mean, Frankie Boyle. There's just so many brilliant conversations. All right, lots of love. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in.